Quick shots. Quick shots. Quick shots. Hey, welcome to Quick Shots. That's right, because I'm back. I'm going to kick us off, and uh, we've not discussed any of this. We just we just wing it sometimes, you know. I think All to the get time. the most authentic answer, Cuzzy, we've just got to pop it and lock it. This one's from Luke. What do you got? Mm-hmm. This one's from Lukey. If it's actually it's a, actually a cracker, and I don't like to make a habit of saying it's a good question because ev- evidently they're all good questions. If all the properties are cash flow positive, what actually stops people from having over ten properties? Is it just the deposit? Great question, and uh, and and Luke's on the money because there is something like two hundred and fifty thousand property investors. Uh, in fact, no, it's uh, two point five million. Sorry, property investors in Australia, and there's roughly uh, two thousand two hundred who own ten properties or more. So you are in rare, rare company. And if they are cash flow positive, which he's obviously heard us talk about, mm-hmm. then it's not the cost of holding them that that should be holding people back. What is it then? It isn't the deposit either, Luke. In my opinion, because uh, you know, I think very fortunate that we do happen to know a lot of people who've got the 10 investment properties, uh, I think it more so comes down to the structure and the strategy that they take. And, and what I mean by that is a lot of people get stuck on two, three, or four uh, because they've got, say, uh, a loan structure that doesn't lend itself to being able to keep scaling and growing the property portfolio. Uh, they may be on interest-only loans, um, uh, sorry, principal and, uh, and interest loans. Or more importantly, what they, uh, I think, run into is they don't buy land. And buying land is really important because not only will the banks lend you more money, they'll lend you 80 to 90%, so you don't have to come up with huge deposits every time you want to do it, uh, but it typically is the property that grows the fastest as well. So you're able to do it and add to your portfolio a lot quicker. So land... um, the loan structures, uh, in addition to being obviously cash flow positive, which is in the question, they're the three for me. Anything to add to that one, Alex? Not really. I mean, the first thing that sort of came to my mind was just, yeah, the lenders, uh, which lenders you're using and, and their uh, risk appetite, I suppose. Because really, the, what we always talk about, the thing that stops you from proceeding is that, um, I mean, obviously, if you got equity and all that, but debt service debt serviceability. But if you're cash flow positive, I mean, technically you're servicing debt. I just wonder if some lenders have like a cap on you know, what they'll give one person with I reckon their, I reckon as a multiple see, of their income. Yeah, I reckon you see a lot of people get stuck with one lender too, where they're, they've yeah. got four or five with them and all of a sudden they can't do anything uh, again unless they change lender. But the lender has absolutely got them by the short and curlies. They've cross collateralized <laughs> all the properties uh, and, and that sort of thing. So yeah. look, it's, it's not an overly complicated thing, but most people don't do it because of the decisions they make early on, Luke, is, is, is uh, our view, I guess. James wants to know, and this is a real James, this is actually like genuinely not me asking this one. What is, the best, what is the best way to manage properties that are physically far from where you live? It's really not that hard. Uh, I know a lot of people want to buy an investment property that's near them so they can drive by it. I got news for you. It doesn't change anything. <laughs> it doesn't change anything. And in my experience, the more removed you are, uh, often the better, especially with tenants and, and stuff like that. You've got to find... And, and do a bit of research, the best property manager in that area. Now, I'm not 100% sure, you know, what, what defines it, but in my world, the best property manager is the one that's probably relatively close to the property or within the area uh, or sort of within the local government area, or I'd say 15, 20-minute drive at most. Um, and also uh, the one that is really good to come back to you. Like they're very responsive. I like the ones that are good with communication because that probably sets a precedent for me later that they'll have be good communicators with the tenant and by default good com- communicator with you. And I think really good property management is down to great communication, um, which you know isn't isn't always hit on nail mm. on the head um, with a lot of guys. But that's like every industry. So that that's my answer. It's really not hard to do. Uh, and, and James, if you are uh, in South Australia, uh, Victoria, New South, if you're in one of those main capital cities, maybe you can hit us up and uh, we can help you out if you're looking for a good property manager. Sometimes you've got to churn and burn them. If they're no good, just leave them. 
Mm. Don't be loyal to a poor communicated property manager. That's all I've got to say on that. David, what is the process to revalue our property? How do we do it? Great question. Uh, you've, you've typically got to ring the bank. If, if you're wanting to do it with your own bank, you've mm. got to ring them. Some of them let you do it online, not many though. Uh, so you've got to pick up the, uh, the phone, David, ask for a new valuation to be done on your property. And it is a great question at the moment because I have seen myself firsthand, but also with a, another a number of uh, friends and family as well, that uh, the properties have gone up in value. And what that means is you actually pay an interest rate based on the loan to value ratio that Mm. the bank has you down for. So uh, if you haven't had your property revalued, you would be getting the interest rate that applies to the loan to value ratio when you bought. And and that was relevant for me because I bought one recently uh, a couple of years ago at 90%. It's now down to nearly 70%, but I hadn't had it revalued. So I finally uh, got off my ass, rang the bank, and uh, what I was able to get is about a half a percent discount just in that act, which really adds up over the course of a year. It is well worth investing the five or 10 minutes of your time to do that little exercise. Better than a kick in the teeth, cuzzy. Not wrong. Hey, Not uh, wrong. thanks for your questions, guys. Hit us up on the Instagram at the double shot dot podcast. Our email's always in the show notes. We love to hear from you. Great to have you back again. Cuz, I just missed you. Luke, James, David, the five disciples, thank you very much, and we'll <laughs> talk to you really soon. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Thanks for listening to another episode of The Double Shot with your favourite cousins, Alex and James Fitzgerald. If you've got a burning question or something we absolutely need to talk about on the pod, please write to us. Both of our emails are in the show notes. For little real estate tidbits and a little bit of banter, okay, a lot of banter, you can follow us on the gram. Our handle is the double shot dot podcast. That, my friends, is the double shot dot podcast. Until next time, think of us when you sit back and sip your next double shot.